This morning's conference is titled Balancing the Scales on Diet Inequality, and that's such a critical and timely topic, of course, for us all. And it looks to be an absolutely fascinating and insightful morning. We're absolutely delighted that Professor Karina Hawkes has joined us and will be chairing this morning's conference and also delivering a presentation later on on the impact of poverty on dietary inequalities. Professor Hawkes is a director of the Centre for Food Policy at City University of London, a centre dedicated to improving food policy to shape a more effective food system for us all. Professor Hawkes has worked for more than 20 years with UN agencies, governments, universities and NGOs at national and international level to support the design of more effective policies and actions to advance healthy diets for all. Karina is now leading a series of projects on people's lived experience of food with the aim of identifying how can we more effectively address dietary inequalities in the UK and internationally. I'll hand over to Professor Karina Hawkes to take us through the programme. Karina, thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's uh, fantastic to be here in this lovely space this morning. And um, welcome to everyone. Uh, thanks, Elaine, and thanks to the British Nutrition Foundation for inviting me to, to chair uh, the event this morning. It's a real privilege and an honor uh, to be here. As indicated by the introduction, this issue of dietary inequalities is one that I'm deeply committed and passionate about. And when I first started in my uh, current role at the Center for Food Policy, I made it a priority to try and understand how food policy could more effectively address dietary inequalities. And I have to say, uh, it's with some deep reflection that I'm looking at the current circumstances around us in the UK and internationally uh, to see that unfortunately, despite uh, the work that many of us have been doing in trying to tackle this problem. Unfortunately, it's only getting worse. So I'm looking forward to this morning um, to get a sense of possibility and really, really exciting to be hearing from various community uh, innovations uh, to really try and understand what can help address uh, this problem because we need answers and we're going to be looking particularly at the diets of, of nutritionally vulnerable young people. And I'm really, really grateful for the British Nutrition Foundation for highlighting this issue of, of health inequalities, and particularly the focus on diet. Um, there is a community of people concerned about inequalities from a household food insecurity perspective, which is incredibly important. And there's a community of people concerned about in, inequalities in diets and obesity, <coughs> And, and different forms of, of malnutrition. And we need to be engaging together to look at the links between financial insecurity, poverty, and in, uh, inequalities with dietary inequalities. So thank you so much to the British Nutrition Foundation for, for highlighting this issue in your um, annual day um, in, this, in this year of 2022. So very excited to be um, uh, chairing this event and, and really looking forward to the fantastic lineup of speakers. And we're privileged to be starting with Dr. Ruth Bell, um, who is a senior advisor at the University College London Institute of Health Equity, which is led by uh, Professor Sir Michael Marmot. And she's a principal research fellow in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health. She's led numerous policy-relevant reports and projects in the area of social determinants of health uh, in the UK and by international organisations, a United Nations Development Programme, uh, UNICEF, UK Department of Health. And she was a senior researcher in the WHO Commission on the Social Determinants of Health, which is a really critically important international report and in bringing attention to health equity. I'm looking forward to the next WHO report coming out uh, relatively soon. So what Ruth's going to do is to set the stage of talking about social inequalities uh, and the impact that this on health and that will be followed by a talk by myself who will specifically focus 
on the relationship between poverty and inequalities. And I'll introduce the other speakers as they come. Ruth. me to this very special day. It's a real honour to be here today. So I'm going to be talking, as Karina mentioned, about health inequalities. And of course, the whole story of health inequalities is really intimately linked up with dietary inequalities, among so many other things. So at the Institute of Health Equity, we've been building reports, gathering the evidence about inequalities in health and about how to tackle inequalities in health through action on the social determinants of health. And in recent years, we have seen these major challenges to health inequalities in England. So first of all, the years of austerity following the 2008 banking crisis, then the COVID pandemic in 2020, and now we're all living through the cost of living crisis. Three successive major challenges on health inequalities. And the Institute of Health Equity published a report just before the 2020 pandemic really spread around in, in England, um, in February 2020, in fact. And this report was following 10 years on from the first Marmot Review report in 2010. So it really covered the whole period when um, we were facing austerity in England. And it laid out the state of social inequalities during that period and the evolution of health inequalities in, in that period and the link between them. And importantly, it made recommendations for action, what could be done about the situation, how to tackle social inequalities through action on the social determinants of health. So I'm, I'm going to start my talk by uh, showing a few of the, the slides which, which really can ground the situation in what, in what the health, state of health inequalities and health is in England at the moment. Now, health we consider to be a, a, a marker of how well society is doing. And life expectancy is used and has been used for many years by the United Nations Development Programme as an indicator of development progress in countries around the world. So life expectancy is an indicator of health. We think health is an indicator of how well a society is doing. And in the UK and England, we're very used to progressive increases in life expectancy over the years. And this graph shows from 1980 to 2010, progressive increases in life expectancy at birth um, for men and women. In fact, life expectancy for women was increasing at a rate of one year every five years, and for men, one year every four years. So looking good, good progress in life expectancy. But then between 2012 and 2018, we see that increase in life expectancy really slowing down. And in effect, life expectancy at birth was stalling during those periods of austerity. And then if we look at the state of health inequalities in England during the period of austerity, 2016 to 18, we see large differences in health ex healthy life, in life expectancy at birth across area deprivation. And you'll know, but I should mention, area deprivation in England is assessed in small areas by uh, data from seven different domains um, education, skills and training, employment, income, health and disability, uh, housing and living conditions, and crime in local areas. So it's a relative measure of deprivation across areas. And what we see, two important things to note from this graph, is the gradient in life expectancy at birth from the most deprived areas to the least deprived areas with the least deprived areas having higher life expectancy than the most deprived areas. And shockingly, we see these large gaps. So the gap for women between those living in the least deprived and those living in the most deprived areas 
at this time was 7.7 .7 years, and for men, 9.5 years gap in life expectancy between those living in the least deprived areas, the most affluent areas, and those living in the most deprived areas. And we also have regional differences in life expectancy in the UK. This is a fairly busy, busy graph, but I'll be brief in explaining it. So we, we have listed a, a number of areas around England, the northeast, northwest, and so on. And what this graph does was compare the least deprived areas of the regions with the most deprived areas of regions in terms of the change in life expectancy between 2010 and 2012 and 2016 to 18. And what it shows is that life expectancy at birth for the least deprived increased between those two time points at, at every level of deprivation. But amongst the most deprived uh, in every region of the country, except for London, the North West, and the West Midlands, there was actually a decline in life expectancy between two, those two time points. And this graph explains that a little bit more. Um, it looks at those two time points for London and the North East, um, comparing life expectancy from the most deprived to the least deprived areas. Again, we see the gradient in life expectancy. Um, in the London region, both the, um, so across all the areas of, of deprivation, we see an increase in life expectancy between these two time periods. But in the northeast region, life expectancy at birth in the most deprived deciles of the region declined between those two dates. So the, the northeast um, was most affected. This graph shows the data for women, but also for men. In the northeast, life expectancy actually declined for the most deprived areas at that time. So looking about at healthy life expectancy at birth. So life, healthy life expectancy is the number of years a child can expect to live in good health. And again, we see a gradient in healthy life expectancy, that's the pale blue, from the most deprived to the least deprived. And we see that the men in the most deprived areas are living less than three quarters of their lives in good general health. So they're living a quarter of their lives in poor health in the most deprived areas of England between 2018 and 20. For women, we see a similar pattern, but women are actually living a third of their lives in poor health in the most deprived areas. So going into the pandemic, health inequalities were not in a good place. And in fact, the COVID pandemic amplified existing social and health inequalities. And in the Institute of Health Equity, we published a, a report uh, that looked at the COVID-19 pandemic, the impact on socioeconomic and health inequalities. And importantly, it made recommendations for building back fairer after the pandemic. And this is from that report, it's Office of National Statistics Data, and it shows the death rates um, across area deprivation levels with the higher, highest death rates amongst the most deprived for all causes, but also for causes involving COVID-19. This is for men. For women, a similar pattern with higher death rate um, from COVID-19 in the most deprived areas. So looking now at some of the, the social inequalities that were happening during the austerity period and, and, and why the country was going into the pandemic and such a poor state of social inequality and, and, and health inequality. So this graph, uh, again, from the 10 years on report, 
shows council spending on services per person. And it shows how it decreased the most in the most deprived areas. So total local authority spending would decline by 31% during the period 2009 to 2020, whereas in the least deprived areas, the decline was 16%, which seems just wrong. Looking at poverty, so this graph is from the Joseph Rowntree Poverty Report published this year, and it looks at the percentage of working age adults in working families in poverty, and it shows in 2019-20 that 68% of working age adults were in poverty during that time, which was the highest on, on record since record began. So what it's really showing is that work is no longer really the way out of poverty for many working people. And of course, it has effects on children. Children in poverty, now 29% of children in poverty after housing costs in, in England. This is from the Department of Work and Pensions data. And Karina is going to talk more about the impact of poverty on health inequalities. But the impact on poverty on, 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 on food inequalities and health inequalities, um, the impact of poverty obviously is devastating for health. Growing up in poverty is very good. It is, growing up in poverty is very bad for child development, for educational outcomes. This has knock-on effects on employment opportunities. Being in poverty impacts affordability of housing, of food, healthy diet, and of fuel. And the development economist Amartya Sen put it this way, relative deprivation in the space of incomes can yield absolute deprivation in the space of capabilities. So being in poverty affects the choices people can make and it impacts on the level of control they have over their lives, both very important for health. So the Marmot Reviews has made sets of recommendations across numerous areas, and um, the overarching areas called Marmot areas or Marmot principles, areas of action, and, and these have direct links too to food and nutrition and diet. Give every child the best start in life. So good maternal nutrition is essential for the growth of children, the development of, as they go through to adulthood, and for giving every child the best start in life. Enable all children, young people and adults to maximize their capabilities and have control over their lives. So we emphasize here education and learning. So healthy meals in schools, widening access to free school meals. How do we enable children to benefit from the education if they not have access to healthy, nutritious food? Create fair employment and good work for all. Healthy eating is also very important in working life. Ensure a healthy standard of living for all. Well, having a healthy, having income for a healthy standard of living, having enough income for a healthy diet, affordability of food is critical at the stage of the cost of living crisis. Create and develop healthy and sustainable places and communities. We know that, in, that fa uh, poor areas have five times more fast food outlets, for example, than the most, most um, affluent areas. So how can we enable um, or create a food environment across all areas that is conducive to healthy diets and nutrition? Strengthen the role and impact of ill health prevention well, we know that healthy diet is crucial for health promotion, ill health pr prevention. How can we ensure that the wider society can provide it sufficient healthy food and, um, to create a situation where everybody has uh, sufficient food for good standard for a healthy diet? Tackle racism, discrimination, 
and their outcomes. Well, food and eating together can bring communities together, or diverse communities together. Pursue environmental sustainability and health equity together. Here we emphasize that food should not only be healthy, but also be sustainable. And we emphasize reducing carbon emissions from uh, food production from, from farm to fork, essentially. So when we talk about reducing inequalities, we talk about uh, leveling up the social gradient or reducing the steepness of, of the gradient in health. We talk about the concept of proportionate universalism. And this graphic, simple graphic, is aiming to illustrate the point of proportionate universalism in that actions should be universal. They should impact on cross society, but also they should be proportionate uh, to the level of, uh, in the scale and intensity, they should be proportionate to the level of disadvantage in society. And a number of cities around England are taking forward this approach to tackling social determinants of health. And the Institute of Health Equity is working with um, some of the, well, all of these places shown here. And some reports have already been worked prepared and, and published, and some are in the process of development. So a number of places are taking forward this approach. And I'm going to talk a bit about Coventry. Coventry was the first city that took on the idea of being a Marmot city and looking at how the Marmot principles could be applied in their local context. And the important initiation was the setting up a steering group um, with very much a focus there on partnership working, which is essential for tackling social determinants of health. So they had national partners like Public Health England, Department for Work and Pensions, business partners, uh, Coventry and Warwickshire Chamber of Commerce, Coventry and Warwickshire local enterprise partnerships, and Coventry City Council, uh, public services, public health, education, libraries and adult learning, procurement, economy and jobs, Coventry, uh, West Midlands, fire service, West Midlands and police were all part of the partnership. And importantly, so were uh, the uh, voluntary and charitable sector, for example, uh, Positive Youth Foundation, uh, Women's Foundation, and the, the Coventry Independent Advice Service. This is just some of the, the, the partners in, in this in this group, all of them working together to focus on how do you improve the situation for people living in Coventry, improve their living conditions, and ultimately improve their health and reduce health inequalities. And uh, we heard this year from a public health consultant in Coventry who's very, uh, talking about uh, some of the outcomes that they've seen in Coventry in recent years since applying this approach. Um, justifiably very pleased that breastfeeding initiation rates in Coventry continuing to exceed national and regional rates. And there's been an increase in the percentage of children with good development in the, uh, by the end of the reception year. Over 2,600 young people supported by the Coventry Ambition Programme. And a reduction in the percentage of young people not in tr education, training, or employment and 27% more Coventry residents in work than seven years ago when the job shop opened. And when employers were challenged to improve working conditions, um, five years ago, average weekly wages were 45 pounds below the UK average, and now they've risen to, they're now 17 pounds below the UK average. So positive outcomes in all these areas, which are social determinants of health, uh, through focusing in partnership with others on the issues. And these are just some of the outcomes, there's many more. So, and the, as I mentioned, the Institute of Health Equity has worked with numerous localities and cities around England, and we have a lot of reports on our website, which I encourage you to have a look at the Institute of Health Equity website. Um, in summary, um, we know that the health of the population is an indicator of how well a society is doing. 
And we know, too, that much can be done to tackle health inequalities and improve population health. And what it really requires is the whole of society working towards this goal of improving health and reducing health inequalities. One sector acting alone can't cure the problem. We need multi-sectoral working, workers working across sectors. And we've seen this, and I mentioned it um, from the Coventry case, that place-based action involving partnerships across business, across local services, public sector, and across the voluntary and charitable sector, and involving communities, can make a difference, and we've seen this. And finally, tackling inequalities in healthy eating is a key element to prevent ill health and health inequalities. Ruth and those of you in the room and online will have the opportunities to pose some questions to Ruth at the panel session later so thank you very much Ruth indeed and that was a, a really fantastic but very sobering analysis of the current situation of health inequalities uh, in this country and I certainly hope uh, that politicians are, are listening to that um, but what was really um, heartwarming uh, was to see that these are problems that can be addressed. So thank you very much for showing that example at the end of how things can improve if the commitment and the policies and practices are in place. So thank you very much, Ruth, uh, indeed to that, uh, for that. Okay, so we're now going to move on to my own presentation in which I'm going to be talking more specifically about uh, dietary uh, inequalities. And I'm going to be sharing the evidence that's been generated uh, by the Lived Experience Research Group at the Centre for Food Policy. So this, I'm presenting uh, the work of my colleagues who are listed um, uh, here on this, uh, on this slide. So thank you very much for them. This is very much from, uh, from our group. The reason why we focused on lived experience research, and we're very much looking forward to hearing some speakers later talking about specific studies, is because of my experience working uh, in uh, policy um, and engaging uh, with the policy environment for, for many years and realizing that from an inequalities perspective, unless we really understood what was going on on the ground, we weren't going to be able to address this problem. And I'm very grateful for uh, the influence, including uh, speakers uh, later on, um, who uh, helped, helped me see that and, and come, to that, uh, come to that perspective. The question that we have is, what are the measures needed to address dietary inequalities? But to understand that, we need to understand more about why we eat what we do. And as I said, the evidence I'm going to present is from the group, but also from the broader literature. But let me just very quickly talk about what the problem is of dietary inequalities. And forgive the rather poor quality of this slide. This is directly taken from the evidence review that was done in support of the independent review uh, towards a national food strategy, and uh, which put this data together, which makes some very clear statements about how, in this country, we mainly fail to meet dietary recommendations. And the work that I do is in the UK, but it's also international, and this is an international, this is a global uh, picture. The, diet, uh, the, the data um, could show more, there could be better data out there, but this is what it says uh, at the moment. Basically, we eat too few fruits and vegetables, fish uh, and fibre, too much salt, saturated fat, sugar and red meat. This won't be uh, news to any of you. But that's relative to the fact that over 80% of families in this country say they actually want to eat healthily and that they want to prioritise that. A lot of intake of ultra-processed foods, um, which some evidence indicates is uh, associated with weight gain, but we're here to talk about dietary inequalities. And if you look at this data here, you'll see that adults on lower incomes are more likely to have diets which are high in sugar, low in fiber, fruits, vegetables, and, um, and fish. And it's the, same, it's the same for children as well. 
And I've used this data, which is quite old data, just to highlight um, the impact on uh, children and, and young people, uh, because it's just so clear from this data, the association with poverty, with this very direct relationship with income. So you have the, lower, the children in lower income families are more likely to consume sweetened drinks, uh, more likely to consume very low levels of fruit, and more likely to, to skip breakfast. And that, um, these, these, trajectory, these trends are very much still in place uh, today. Now, of course, income isn't the only form of inequality. There's plenty of other forms of, 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 of inequality, race, racial inequality, of course, being uh, one critically important example. I'm going to focus, though, on the poverty aspects of um, inequality. And just to highlight, of course, is an intersection with food insecurity, uh, with um, families, including many families in work, many families in work, um, again, a universal credit, and we've made that point as well, experiencing more food insecurity. And I'll show how the two, uh, two aspects overlap, and of course, with the uh, very um, disturbing figures of the increases in recent, in, in recent months. So then why do we see this relationship between poverty and dietary inequalities? The relationship emerges from the multiple dimensions of poverty. Often when you say poverty, you think of income, and I've just given the data on income. And that is the first element of this relationship. We actually prefer to use the term financial insecurity, which my colleague Anna Isaacs was very clear about uh, when she was starting her studies in my group a few years ago, because she found it wasn't just the level of income that families received, it's how predictable it is, it's how variable it is, and I'll show in a minute the impact that that can have. But it's also to do with the fact that food is a flexible item in the budget. So when you've got these demands on income, and we heard about housing earlier, debt payments are also very important for a lot of low-income families. And of course, at the moment, the increasing cost of energy. And that's just to, to name three. So the financial insecurity aspects of living life on a low income influences, uh, intersects with these other aspects to influence dietary inequalities. So my argument is, is that if we're really going to understand the solutions to this problem, we need to understand the full picture of people's realities who are living life on a low income. And let's look at this picture. Forgive the very crowded slide, but there are many of these realities. And let me take you through it by asking you to step into the shoes of somebody who has this experience. Let's take a woman who has a couple, two or three kids maybe, who lives with a partner and they live in a household in a situation of financial insecurity with low, variable and unpredictable income with a ton of different demands on their income. Let's call this woman Marie for the, for the sake of it. Well, Marie is very, very, very skilled at budgeting, as most people on low incomes are. And um, so she has to balance all of these different um, financial um, demands with a very limited income. And she's a human being, like anybody who doesn't, isn't fully of con in control of things, that causes a lot of anxiety. Uh, and so that can lead to uh, mental health uh, impacts. And um, so she's doing the best she possibly can, but it kind of reduces the headspace that she has. And she really, really wants, like most people, like most mothers, she really wants her to be healthy. She really wants her child to be healthy. She has a good general knowledge of what a healthy diet means. And she also has skills. She knows how to, to cook, um, like many people do on, on low incomes. And um, she lives in private rented accommodation, which is expensive and it doesn't really have any kind of a kitchen space. The cooker often doesn't work when she tries to use it. It's a very unpleasant, tight space. She doesn't like being in there. It's not one of these gleaming, wonderful, white tiled places that a family on a higher income uh, might have. And even if she does make the effort to cook um, in this very difficult space, 
There's nowhere to eat, so it's just awkward and difficult um, it, with, her, with her family. And then there's the fact that she works extremely long hours for low and unpredictable pay. And at home, while she does have a partner, she's the one who has the responsibility for the food work. And it's a lot of work, as many of you will understand. And it's even more work for a woman on a low income because she has to do extra work to try and manage her budget. So she has to go from store to store to store to find the cheapest product of everything. And then once she's in the store, she has to be adding up to make sure that she can afford all of that food. So given that situation, what this woman Marie is looking for is foods which she can afford, foods which aren't going to be wasted because she can't afford to waste that food. She's looking for food that can be stored to manage unpredictable income. She's looking for food that can be prepared with relatively low use of energy in the kitchen, with very few assets in the kitchen, and um, with relatively little work, and with relatively limited headspace compared to somebody on a higher income. So she gets what she's looking for then are uh, long shelf life foods, convenience foods, freezer foods, snack foods, pre-prepared foods, takeout foods, and palatable foods that her family are going to like and not going to waste. So she goes out into a food environment, and until relatively recently, she could find a lot of these products. There were access to these products in the food environment in which she lived. There was just one snag. Most of them weren't very healthy. Most of them weren't very healthy, and some were fine, like pasta, for example, very, very widely consumed and cheap food. But it's not unhealthy, but it doesn't exactly, it's not very nutritionally dense. So there's a combination of foods that are actively unhealthy and then foods which aren't adding a lot of nutrition. And the, on the occasions, she did pretty well to manage her budget until recently. She was at that border of food insecurity. She's now gone into food insecurity because of the increasing price of foods. So she's having to use food banks more and more, which provide these long self life foods. Also, when she was in the food environment, there were these enticements all around her, prompting her to buy these less healthy foods. And she knows she didn't want to buy them. In some cases, they were actually more expensive than the other foods. But she had a child saying, please, please, I've seen these advertised on digital media, on my phone, on, on TV, whatever it is. Um, please buy it. And then that really gets to her as an identity as a mother because it's meaningful for her to try and serve her family enough food. And that's part of her identity. It's a socially influenced identity, but it's an important part of her identity. And then if she feels that she's failing her children, failing her family, she feels even more stressed. She feels even more guilty. And so she's very vulnerable to those promotions out there. And she just says, I know I shouldn't, but I will, because it's on promotion its value for money. And she also knows full well there are foods in that food environment which are within her budget. Cabbage and carrots, onions, some food in tins, packages of pulses and beans. They are affordable. But how can she really prepare them when she's working a long job and she doesn't have a really a good kitchen um, to prepare them in? And when her children because they haven't been exposed to these kinds of food, haven't developed the taste preferences for these kinds of foods, unlike the kids in the higher income backgrounds, and therefore don't like them, and therefore are prone to waste them, which you can't afford to do. And not only that, in her food environment, um, there are spaces that her older kids like to go to where you can really get unhealthy, like chicken shops, where you can really get unhealthy food uh, really very, very cheaply. They're the only spaces that her older adolescent can go and feel socially supported, feel welcomed, trying to connect with his other teenage friends. And so that space which provides healthy food is socially supportive for her and her family. And not only that, but over the years, she's begun to trust the places where she buys food. She feels welcomed. She feels, yeah, this is a place that is trying to help me meet my needs. So all of these issues of trust, of meaning, of the development of taste preferences, deeply embedded social issues, mean that these unhealthy diets become a culture. 
and become deeply embedded. And then that influences what happens when you try and make those changes. And so despite her general knowledge and her desire for a healthy diet, the full, pictures of, the full picture of Marie's life means that it's both rational and logical to eat the diet that she does, but also for deep emotional reasons. It makes sense to eat these foods, and they also happen to be the less healthy food, which is outside of her control. So how do we make change in this context? A context in which dietary inequalities have become deeply embedded in our society. We need to change the full picture of realities. It's clear we need to address food insecurity. That's very clear. But just imagine if you only change the food insecurity aspect of Marie's life. Her kids haven't yet developed taste preferences for the healthier food, which is now better able to afford. So that needs to be addressed. Just imagine if you were to change the food environment and take the unhealthy stuff out and just replace it with nutritious foods. Well, her, uh, her older uh, adolescent kids may be saying, well, but that's not our food. We don't associate, we don't have an identity with that food. That's kind of fit food for those people over there. Um, and so that needs to be addressed, these issues of uh, meaning and, um, and identity. And issues of housing and of labor need to be addressed in order to make sure that, for, that she has the time in order to prepare those foods at home. So all of these issues need to be addressed in tandem to really deeply address these issues. Another one is price. If you say, okay, let's make the healthier food cheaper, that's really, really important thing to do or to, to increase access to it, um, but it's not going to have the impact unless you change all of these other aspects. So in other words, it isn't a question of saying, this is a solution here, this is a solution here, this is a solution there, and let's get on our high horse and fight for our solution. We need to address this full picture. And they needed to be tailored to different populations, which is why you need to involve communities in identifying what these solutions are going to be. The second thing to do is to consider people's realities when you're de designing an individual policy or intervention. So I've given an evidence-based example of school breakfast uh, clubs here. So um, uh, this, uh, by taking a single intervention, you can see that how they need to be designed. So clearly, if it is a free intervention, that's going to address uh, the financial insecurity aspects of Marie's life. Um, but it wouldn't be if you're not thinking about if you don't make it free or it'll do it to a much lesser degree. Uh, they clearly have big advantages, these kinds of interventions, because you are reducing the demand on household assets. You're removing the labor, the time, the stress of serving a meal. You're covering childcare, which is also a source of stress. But all of this is happening only on, on school days and not managing the other, unless it's, it goes during the, the holidays, which I know some of them do. It's providing a solution to access to healthy foods, but it may not if the child in the breakfast club isn't attuned to those foods and isn't used to them and doesn't like them and therefore tends to select the he less healthy uh, varieties, whereas the higher income uh, kids might choose the healthier varieties. And so that requires some additional um, support. They're fantastic spaces to build up a social relationships and have really good social support and peer-to-peer -peer support for eating a healthier breakfast. But they also risk social stigma with this idea that that's just for poor people, that's not for me, and this kind of marginalization. That's also a risk that needs to be managed, and many good school breakfast programs do. There's also the issue, particularly for older kids, that you might walk past, you've got a tiny little bit of money, and on your way to the breakfast club, you might walk past a food swamp, lots of unhealthy food around you, and end up buying something and then eating it in addition to, um, to the food um, at the breakfast club, which then increases risk um, of obesity. So you just need to be thinking about all of this full picture when you're designing uh, individuals, uh, individual interventions. So I'll end there. 
key message when working to address dietary inequalities, consider the full picture of realities, the full picture of healthy food policy. Uh, this is very much a work in progress, so I'd very much welcome feedback from anyone. And if you do have feedback, here's a couple of email addresses to contact. Thank you very much. Thank you.